Greetings, everyone. How are you guys doing out there? Today, we're going to be unlocking the Celestial Code. Welcome to my channel. My name is Ishma Prez. I am your galactic historian, cosmic ambassador to the Earth, author of the bestseller, Our Cosmic Origin. Are you guys ready to go deep in unlocking the Celestial Code as we decipher the different categories and orders of angelic beings that are part of the angelic hierarchy? So before I get to that, I would like to uh, share a little bit about uh, myself. As you guys know, I am a type of person who likes to strike a balance between mind, body, and spirit, right? I meditate for my spirit. I read and do research for my mind. And I also love working out for my body. So we are triune beings, all right? Well, they say, you know, there's a fourth part or aspect of ourselves, right, where physical, we're spiritual, we're mental, and we're emotional. So to me, it's all about maintaining that equilibrium between mind, body, and spirit and emotions in order to evolve, you know, through a balanced way. Now, um, I want to welcome everyone for being here. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here tonight on a Wednesday night uh, with the Galactic Jedis that are in the house. I acknowledge and I want to express deep gratitude to each and every single one of you guys. You guys are awesome. Uh, the most awakened crowd I've ever known right here on my channel. Thank you guys for being here. Now, something I do want to share uh, regarding the day in history, as today is, I will say the date, the 7th of February, right, 2024, right, on the positive ascending timeline. <laughs> so I always want to say the date now because of the fact that I do have other pirate channels that are always trying to steal my stuff to put it on those uh, other accounts. So today's the 7th of February, 2024. Um, I would like to share that uh, what events took place on this day in the past. Well, in 2013, Mississippi became the last state to ban slavery. Um, a Mississippi was the last holdout of the 36 states. The state rejected the amendment of December 5th, 1865, because lawmakers were unhappy that they did not uh, had not been reimbursed for the value of freed slaves. It took about 130 years for them to go back and tie up that loose end. On March 16, 1995, the State House unanimously approved a resolution that had already been unanimously passed in the Senate, and Mississippi finally ratified the 13th Amendment. Um, let's see. So that's you know an example of what happened today. Uh, so I would like to also, um, well, before I get to the juicy top topic, I would like to uh, unveil the secrets, all right? Well, I will be unrevealing the secrets of the angelic orders, decoding ancient texts. This is where I was able to gather a lot of this information, and I will share with you guys uh, some of these texts, some of the sacred teachings that reveal the roles, the powers, and the divine purpose of these heavenly messengers, from the seraphim's fiery passion to the archangel's protective guidance. Uh, let's dive deep into the spiritual dimensions where these celestial beings operate and influence our world. And uh, once again, I want to shout out to all the galactic Jedis that are in the house and also all of those that are going to watch it on the replay. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing space with me. I appreciate each and every single one of you. Now, upcoming events. Final call for my appearance and presentation at the Conscious Live Expo in Los Angeles at the Hilton this weekend. For those that didn't know, I'm going to be there Saturday morning presenting in the rabbit hole room from about 10 o'clock a.m. to about 11.30 a.m., breaking down the entire cosmic history of the earth uh, and also giving you guys a PowerPoint presentation uh, revealing and describing the different 15 dimensions that comprise our omniverse and the cosmic structure. And on Sunday, the following day, I'm going to be one of the panelists in the Planetary Ascension panel hosted by Deborah Gusti. So I hope to see some of you guys there at the Conscious Live Expo this coming weekend, the 9th, the 10th, and the, and the 11th. And for those that haven't had a chance to order my book, Our Cosmic Origin, I always put a direct link to my book in the description. Make sure that uh, you click the link if you haven't had a chance to order your own copy. Again, it is a book of initiation, activation, 
and it will trigger memories of an ancient galactic past that you were all involved in, whether you know it or not. Now, uh, one last thing before I go into the juicy topic. So here is a, a list of, um, you know, where I was able to derive all of this information. So uh, I was able to research a lot of this information from the Bible. All right. Even though it's a book of metaphors, there's still a lot of truths in the Bible, uh, particularly from the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation and various passages in both the Old and New Testaments that provide descriptions of who the angels are, their roles and their interactions with humanity. The book of Enoch, even though it was left out of the official canon, right, part of the Apocrypha, the book of Enoch is also a pseudo epigraphal work attributed to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah. It includes detailed accounts of the watchers, the angels who descended upon the earth, their influence on humanity, and the hierarchy of angels. It's considered an important work in the Jewish mysticism and early Christian thought. I also was able to dig information from the Sohar, a fundamental work in Jewish mystical thought known as the Kabbalah. The Sohar contains discussions on the nature of God, the universe, the souls of humans, and the hierarchy of angels as part of the Sephirot and the Tree of Life. I was also able to gather information from non-Judeo-Christian traditions. For example, the Suedo Dionysus, the Aeropagite, the Aeropagite celestial hierarchy coming from the Suedo Dionysius. Uh, this Christian mystical text from the 5th to the 6th century AD is one of the first systematically categorizing angels into three hierarchies and nine orders. It has profoundly influenced Christian archaeology and mysticism. Um, the, fifth, um, the fifth article that I'm going to be sharing is from the Key of Solomon, and this is called the Clavicula Solomonesis. All right. So I'm giving you guys the names of these articles so that way you guys could also do your own research. This is a Renaissance grimoire traditionally attributed to King Solomon, containing detailed descriptions of how to communicate or command the angels. By the way, the angels are here to do our bidding. We are higher than the angels, guys. We are God's ultimate creation. Remember that they are here to serve us. We don't serve the angels. They serve us. All right, so uh, in the description, how to communicate and command the angels, uh, including the seals and the names of various angels. Uh, the sixth piece of article that I'm going to read comes from the Coptic Gnostic Library. The Coptic Gnostic Library, a collection of Gnostic Christian texts discovered in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, in about 1945. These texts offer insights into early Christian mystical practices and beliefs about angels and the spiritual hierarchy. The seventh piece of information comes from the Corpus Hermeticum, the Corpus Hermeticum, hence Hermeticism, a series of Greek texts from the second and third centuries AD, which are the fundamental documents of Hermeticism. Uh, they discuss the nature of the divine, the cosmos, the mind, the soul, often mentioning angels and other divine beings that are part of the cosmic order. The eighth piece of information that I was able to decipher some of this information from is from the Sefar Yetzira, the Book of Formation, an early Jewish text considered to be the Book of Mysticism. It discusses the creation of the universe and the role of angels in the cosmos through the use of the Hebrew alphabet and numbers. And then finally, but not least, I was also able to derive the information regarding uh, uncoding the celestial hierarchy from the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, a collection of Jewish texts found in the Qunram caves, some of which include references to angelic beings and the roles in the divine plan, providing a unique insight into the Second Temple uh, beliefs. Okay, so are you guys ready for this? Again, I want to welcome all 554 people that are in the house. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for sharing and and spending time with me on this Wednesday evening on planet Earth, the most important planet in the grand scheme of things. All right, so let's let's get into the juicy information. All right, so Article 1, the Bible. <laughs> the Bible contains numerous references to angels and their interactions with humans, offering insights into their roles, hierarchies, and characteristics. Here are detailed explanations of some key biblical passages related to angels. The Old Testament references. 
Genesis chapter 19, verse 1 through 26. This passage describes two angels visiting Lot in Saddam. They warn him of the impending destruction of the city and assist him and his family in escaping, showcasing angels acting as messengers and protectors. Well, for those that have read my book, we do know that those three angels that were in instrumental in the warning of Lot's family, right, or Abraham's family, particularly to Lot and his wife, were the angelics, or what we call the positive Anunnaki, those that carried the Syrian Pleiadian Lyran genetics that were descendants of Zeus and Lil, all right? Those were the positive watchers, the ones that did not rebel against God, the ones that did not rebel or that, that did not join the Luciferian rebellion. Okay, so bear in mind that some of these celestials, right, especially those that are coming from the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimension, are also equivalent to what we call extraterrestrials, right? So we have two functions. We have positive extraterrestrials, right? And we have negative extraterrestrials, commonly known as the Watchers, all right, the Niberians. All right, so let me continue. Daniel 10, chapter 10 um, and 13, verse 20 to 21. Here, the angel Michael is described as a protector of Israel, battling spiritual forces, the passage is one of the clearest biblical references to the idea of an angelic hierarchy and the concept of guardian angels over nations. All right. Many of you, many of you have worked with Michael, Metatron, and some of these other angels, Raphael, Uriel, Gabriel. All right. I'm speaking to the choir, guys. All right. Um, thank you for all the love. Thank you guys for hitting the like button. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Deep gratitude from the bottom of my soul. All right, so um, this passage is one of the clearest biblical references to the idea of an angelic hierarchy and the concept of guardian angels over nations. All right, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 to 6. The angel of the Lord appears to Moses in a burning bush, delivering God's command to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Again, for those that have read my book, it was Enlil Seuss, whichever interpretation you want to go by that appeared to Moses in the burning bush. That was the, you know, what we call the, the ancient guardian of the earth, okay? Um, the encounter is illustrates an angel acting as a direct messenger of God, capable of miraculous manifestations. In the book of Psalms, chapter 21, from verse 11 to 12, it says, this Psalms promises that God will command his angels to guard the faithful, protecting them from harm. It reflects the belief in guardian angels who watch over the individuals, who watch over the individuals. Okay, so now let's go to the New Testament, all right? And then after the New Testament, we're going to go into some other texts coming from the Greek translations, from Gnosticism, and so on and so forth. We're going to approach this topic from every angle, every written document that continues to exist in this planet. So according to the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, the angel Gabriel visits Mary to announce that she will give birth to Jesus, the Son of God. Gabriel's role as a messenger delivering news of great importance is a clear example of angels acting as divine heralds. The book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 11. After Jesus is tempted by the devil, who, by the way, was Marduk, right? That story where Satan appeared to him when he was fasting for 30 days or 40 nights or 40 days, 40 nights, whatever. That was Marduk, guys. Marduk was the one who appeared to Joshua, Jesus, in an effort to, you know, give him the power of this world or give him, you know, the throne. And he said, get behind me, Satan. He was actually talking to Marduk because Marduk, the son of Enki, has been the, you know, leader of the dark forces for the last 6,000 years. So let's just make sure that you guys know that it was Marduk who tried to tempt Joshua into siding with him. But Joshua said, get behind me, Satan. He was talking about Marduk. So now you know, all right, the angels in the Bible are the Anunnaki, just different terminologies. So, and their descendants, of course, or their children. Um, providing care and support. Uh, this shows angels acting in a nurturing and protective role. Okay, so let me continue. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 14, this verse describes angels as ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation, highlighting the role as servants of God, uh, tasked with assisting humans. Okay, fair enough. 
The book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 7 to 9. The book of Revelation describes a war in heaven in which Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and his angels. Michael's victory emphasizes the concept of good versus evil within the angelic realm and the protective role of angels. Now, in terms of the galactic history, we know that the descendants of Michael established their stronghold in Lyra, hence the lion. The lion is the emblem of the house of Avion, of the house of King David, of the original Magi, Magi Grail king lineage and queen lineage. Okay, So we do know that the Bible condensed the war in heaven, which was the galactic wars between Michael the Lyrans and Lucifer, the draconian Siakars. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. So Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. All right. Michael's victory emphasizes the concept of good versus evil within the angelic realm and the protective role of angels. The book of Revelations, chapter 22, verse 8 to 9. John is told by an angel not to worship him, for he is a fellow servant with John and the prophets. This underscores the idea that angels, while powerful and holy, are not to be worshipped, but are also servants of God. And they are not to be worshipped. In fact, let me remind you guys that as the ultimate creation within the 12 living universes, we have the power to command the angels, and they were designed to serve us. Remember, we are God's ultimate masterpiece. For those that have read my book, um, it's you know detailed there in our cosmic origin. All right, let me continue. These passages offer a glimpse into the multifaceted roles of angels in the Bible, from guardians and warriors to messengers and servants of God. They portray a celestial hierarchy that operates under God's command, intervening in human affairs according to divine will, the diversity of these roles across the biblical narrative showcase the complexity and depth of angelology within Christian theology. Now, as you guys know, and as I revealed in my book, the angels are the beings, the interdimensionals that come from the celestial realms. Remember, there are the celestial realms, the etheric realms, and the terrestrial realms, okay? So we are part of the terrestrial realms. Did I just lose a little bit of light here? I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I felt like there was a shape that came upon my atmosphere here. Anyways, oh, it's the phone. Here we go. <laughs> all right. Article two coming from the key, the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch, which was a left out book from the canonized, accepted, you know, Bible. Okay. So it is an ancient Jewish apocalyptic text attributed to Enoch, the great grandfather of Noah. The book is divided into several parts with the first section known as the Book of the Watchers, chapter 1 to 36, being particularly relevant for its detailed descriptions of angels and their hierarchy. Here are some detailed insights into references from the Book of Enoch. So this is coming from the Book of Enoch. The fallen angels are the fallen watchers, right? Talk about the fallen watchers. Chapter 6, verse 16. These chapters narrate the story of the watchers, a group of 200 angels, right, who descended to the earth to take human wives, leading to the birth of the Nephilim giants who have wrecked havoc upon the earth. Well, again, the 200 angels who descended upon the earth are the Igigi, right, that were in, the, that were in charge of the Mars station when the Anunnaki were on, on this planet. And so they were also working for who? For Enki. The Igigi, which were not carriers of the pure angelic strain of Lyran, Syrian, Pleiadian genetics, were prohibited to mix with the daughters of evolving men for a reason. They carried genetic abominations. They carried draconian abominations. They carried Zeta, Gray, and Insectoid. Of course, we also know that a lot of the Igigi were Grays, which were a downgraded version of of an ancient human race that decided to resort to cloning and had lost their connection to God. And that is the reason why they couldn't intermix with the daughters of men, because they were trying to corrupt the bloodline of Adam that led to Jesus. All right. Um, again, a lot of these stories are metaphors, guys. We have to go beyond the literacy, you could say. Okay. All right. So this act was against God's will resulting in the imprisonment of these angels in the abyss as punishment. The leader of these angels, 
Azazel, Azazel, which again was Enki, right? The biblical Hebrew name for Enki is Azazel, as it's Poseidon to the Greeks, same entity, right? By now you should know that the Anunnaki had multiple names depending on which tradition you read it from. So the leader of these angels, Azazel, Enki, whatever you want to call him, is specifically blamed for teaching humans to make weapons <laughs> and cosmetics, thereby spreading sin. And like I mentioned in the Battle of the Gods video the other day, Enki was also the one who taught men sorcery, necromancy, and black magic. Okay, He taught the women incan you know, incantations, how to cast spells, and so on and so forth. Enoch's journey, Enoch's journey, all right? So chapter 17, verse 36. Enoch undertakes heavenly journeys guided by angels, revealing the secrets of the heavens and the earthly realms. This passage provides vivid descriptions of the cosmos from a theological perspective, including the places of punishment reserved for the fallen angels and the righteous areas for those aligned with divine will. All right, so the nine orders of angels, beginning with the archangels. The archangels, descriptions of the archangels and their specific duties as scattered throughout the text. Important figures include Michael, described as a merciful and patient archangel, ag acting against the adversarial spirits of the fallen angels and advocating for the people of God. Okay, so we do know that Michael is... Revealed in every ancient culture, even it's in the Bhava Gita and the Indian texts, um, Michael and Krishna are one and the same, right? Different names, but the same entity, okay? Um, Raphael, who's Raphael, All right? As a member of the archangels. And, and by the way, there is a difference. The term arch has nothing to do with archons, guys. Those are two separate terminologies. The word arc means to lead. So the archangels are the leaders of the other orders, which I will get into. So Raphael, tasked with healing and binding the spirits of the fallen angels. And then we have Gabriel. Gabriel plays a role in overcoming the evil spirits of the giants, the offspring of the watchers. Again, the offspring of the Igigi, who were the group headed by Enki, right? The abomination of desolation. And will play a crucial role in the eschatological war. And for those who don't know what the word esco, eschatological is, a terminology describing the end of days, the apocalypse, which has nothing to do with the end of the world, as a reminder, but everything to do with the great reveal that is about to take place, all right? And you guys are all in the in the forefront for that. You guys are all ahead of the general public as a result of, you know, having this understanding. And for those who have read my book, you are light years away when it comes to disclosure. All right. So let me continue. Uriel. Uriel guides Enoch through the earth and the heavens, revealing the workings of the cosmos and the fates of the fallen angels. All right. So we do know that every ancient account talks about this final judgment. What is this final judgment? All right. Well, first of all, it is not a judgment of an external entity that is watching down with a beard, looking down to throw darts at everybody who doesn't align or misbehaves. It is actually the judgment of our higher self. Uh, each and every single one of you guys has a higher self. That is the ultimate judger of your life, by the way. And when you are going into a life review, right, in between all your incarnations, guess who reviews your life? Your higher self. You are ultimately your, your own judge when it comes to this, okay? But again, um, a lot of this stuff in these religious texts were modified, and they're not to be taken literally, all right? So chapter 45 in um, I guess, uh, what book is this? It's called The Final Judgment. Oh, I didn't even realize there was a book called The Final Judgment, but I guess it was a non-accepted book in the Bible. So chapter 45 to 57, these sections deal with the eschatological theme, including the final judgment where the wicked angels and the humans are punished, the humans that are wicked, not the righteous. And that is a general prophecy, by the way, that uh, was 
preserved by every religious tradition, including the secret esoteric spiritual tradition of the mystic or of the Western and Eastern adepts as well. They all talk about this final judgment against the wicked, right? Well, what do you think is happening right now? Who are the wicked? The cabal, right? And all of those people that are inflicting pain upon others. All right. So Enoch sees visions of a future messianic kingdom often associated with the son of man where righteousness will prevail and the fallen angels along with the kings and along with the kings and mighty will be judged so that's what's happening right now guys you know as the evil people of this world become exposed um they're going to be judged by their higher selves which is and they're pissed of course Okay, so the Astronomical Book. Did you guys know that there was a book called the Astronomical Book? These are books that were left out of the canon, by the way. Okay, so chapter 72, verse 82, says, also known as the Book of the Heavenly Luminaries. This section details a complex celestial system governed by angelic beings explaining the notion of the heavenly bodies and the regulation of all seasons, all overseen by angels. So Article 3 from the Sohar, from the Sohar, the Sohar is a fundamental work in Jewish mysticism known as Kabbalah. It is a complex and extensive text written in Aramaic and attributed to Rabbi Simon Bar Yochai uh, in the second century Jewish, who is a second century Jewish sage. However, modern scholarships generally agree that it was composed by Moses de Leon in the late 13th century in Spain, who, by the way, Moses de Leon in the late 13th century of Spain was also a member of the Knights Templar. So they were associated with the Brotherhood of Light, the Melchizedek Order, right? <laughs> All right, uh, let me continue. Uh, along with the discussions on the nature of God, the structure of the universe, the journey of the soul, and the role of angels within the cosmic framework. Here's a detailed look at some of the key references to angels in the Sohar. Are you guys ready? The role and nature of angels, angelic missions. The Sohar describes angels as emanations and messengers of God, each with specific roles and functions. Angels are sent to the physical world to perform tasks according to divine will, influencing events on earth and the spiritual development of human beings. Hierarchy of angels, similar to other mystical texts, the Sohar outlines a hierarchical structure of the angelic realm. This hierarchy often parallels the self-lerotic structure of the tree of life, with different groups of angels corresponding to different divine emanations. For example, the angels known as Shayat Hekodish are associated with the Sephira of Keter, which represents the crown chakra representing the will of God. Excuse me. <coughs> Angelic uh, cores, the Sohar, through its mystical exegesis, occasionally refers to the traditional division of angels into specific cores or ranks, such as seraphim, cherubim, and thrones, which I will go over in a bit. These cores, these cores, serve various functions in the divine realm, from worshiping God to executing justice. Angels in the divine presence. Shekinah. Shekinah. Do you guys know that the Shekinah is also a representative of the mother goddess, the Shekinah universe, the central universe, the mother universe, the Shekinah universe? They're all one and the same. Shekinah, one of the central themes of the Sohar is the Shekinah, the indwelling presence of God in the world. All right. Angels are often depicted as accompanying the Shekinah, who represents the divine sacred mother, uh, protecting and serving this divine presence that resides within all of creation. This, I thank you guys for all the love. I appreciate that. I see all the hearts moving up. All right, the interaction between angels and the Shekinah highlights the interplay between the divine and the earthly with angels acting as intermediaries. intermediaries. Now, according to the mystical encounters and revelations, 
All right. Visions and revelations. The soul heart contains numerous accounts of mystical visions and encounters with angels. These experiences often serve as a means for the transmission of mystical knowledge and divine secrets to humans. Through these encounters, sages and mystics, including Rashbi and his disciples, receive insights into the nature of God, the soul, and the cosmic order. The angelic influence on, on souls. The angelic influence on souls. Guardian angels. The soul heart elaborates on the concept of guardian angels with each soul having an angelic counterpart that watches over it. What does that mean, guys? That means that while a portion of your consciousness is here embodying a human avatar, the other part of your consciousness are your spirit guides, are the angels. See, we live in a holistic reality. There is no separation between these angels and us. They are us in higher dimensions. We are them in the lower dimensions. All right? I want you guys to remember that. <laughs> uh, like, let's continue here. So these guardian angels advocate on behalf of the change charges in the heavenly courts and guide them in their spiritual journeys. Angels and souls after death. The text explores the journey of the soul after death, detailing how angels guide righteous souls to the Garden of Eden and how they deal with the souls of the wicked. This aspect of angelology emphasizes the role of angels in the process of divine judgment and afterlife. Practical Kabbalah and Angelic Names Invocations and Names The Sohar discusses the use of angelic names for practical Kabbalistic purposes, including healing, protection, and spiritual ascent. These names, when properly invoked, are believed to harness the energies of the angels, facilitating divine intervention in the world. The Sohar treatment of angels is deeply embedded in its mystical cosmology Portraying these beings not just as servants of God, but as, as integral components, see, as integral components of the divine structure of the universe and ourselves. According to the mystical traditions, they never said that the angels were separate entities than us. But according to this mystical text, they are a holistic, inter integrative part of us, right? <laughs> the entire universe, the entire, let, let me correct myself, the entire omniverse is one single conscious entity experiencing itself through all the different fractals, from the celestial hierarchy all the way to the terrestrial worlds where we exist in the lower dimensions, guys. All right, Article 4. Article 4. Oh, before I get to Article 4. <laughs> The depiction in the soul heart transcends mere theological abstraction, offering a nonce or nouns, I can't even say that word, nuance, offering a nuance understanding of the symbiotic relationship between the celestial and terrestrial realms. <laughs> Article four. Article four. The Suedo Dionysius, the Aeropegite, the, the Aeropegite celestial hierarchy. Written in the late 5th to early 6th century, the work is attributed to Dionysus the Aeropagite, a figure mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, excuse me, chapter 17, verse 34 of the New Testament. Though the true author remains anonymous, the celestial hierarchy elaborates on a complex system of angels, dividing them into three hierarchies, each containing three orders or course making a total of nine orders of angels. This categorization system has shaped much of the Christian understanding of the celestial order. Here is a detailed look at the references and implications of this seminal work. The three hierarchies and their orders. All right, the first one. The first hierarchy closest to God, which is what? The highest vibrating frequency of our omniverse, right? God is a frequency that exists within each and every single one of us. We just have to match that frequency through the raising of our own vibrational frequency. Very simple, right? As we ascend, we become light beings. As we descend, we become matter, right? Now there is a point when 
we begin to integrate both light and matter as one and the same so that we could spiritualize matter. All right. That's what we're doing here so that we could become physical immortals. <laughs> all right, guys, I want to welcome all 880 or 32 people that are in the house. Thank you so much for being here. Where am I? Where am I? So the first category is known as the seraphim, the seraphim. These angels are close to God, encircling his throne and constantly singing his praises. They present a divine love and light, and their name means the burning ones, signifying their intense love for the creator that burns away all impurities. The second category is known as the cherubim, the cherubim. Known for their deep insight and wisdom, cherubim are tasked with the guardianship of God's glory. They are often described as having multiple faces or wings, symbolizing their all-encompassing knowledge of our Creator's plan. Then comes the thrones, the thrones. Acting as the chariots of God, thrones are described as the embodying divine justice and authority. They serve as the instruments of God's judgment, ensuring His will is carried out in the cosmos. All right, so the second hierarchy, governors of the cosmos, are the dominions or the dominations. These angels regulate the duties of lower angels, maintaining order in the universe. They are seen as channeling the commands of the upper hierarchies to the angels below, ensuring the cosmos remains in harmony. Then comes the virtues. The virtues tasked with the execution of miracles and maintenance of the natural order. Virtues provide courage, grace, and valor. valor, valor. They empower humans to overcome obstacles and embody divine strength. After the virtues come the powers. The powers serving as warriors and defenders of the cosmos. Powers fight against demonic entities to prevent chaos in the universe. They are guardians of the spiritual pathways between heaven and earth. The third hierarchy, direct interactions with the human world. All right. They are the principalities. These angels oversee nations, realms, and leaders, guiding them according to divine will. They are involved in the governance of the world and in the administration of the divine justice. Then comes the archangels. The archangels, well-known figures such as Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Oriel, which all fall under this category. Archangels deliver God's most important messages to humans and lead the heavenly host in the battle against darkness. And then after, of course, comes just the angels, the angels. The lowest and closest order to humanity, these angels are personal guardians, guiding and protecting individuals. Each person is said to have a guardian angel assigned to them. That's fascinating. Fascinating. All right. So there is more, guys. Are you guys ready for this? There is more. Uh, just to make a correspondence, all right, um, within the spectrum of interdimensional extraterrestrial entities, we have the uh, ultraviolets, which are under the level of the functionary entities as, which are the functionaries under the order of dates known as the creator gods. And then after the ultraviolets, we also have different levels of extraterrestrial beings all the way to the, uh, that go down to the fifth dimension. So bear in mind that a lot of these entities that are described in these various texts are also corresponding to the different types of interdimensional celestial Beings that we now call extraterrestrials. They're all one and the same. All right. Oh, a little stretch here. <laughs> How's everyone doing here? All right. There's more theological and mystical implications. Give me a second here. It is getting hot. <laughs> so, all right. So theological and mystical explanations. Are you guys ready for more? Oh, implications. Sorry. Here we go. So, Suedo Dionysius' work on the celestial hierarchy aims to demonstrate the order and harmony of the universe, reflecting the perfect order of God's creation. The detailed description of the angelic order serves to illustrate the ways in which divine grace and guidance are mediated to the world. The angels act as messengers of God's will, but also as models of contemplation and worship, with each other reflecting a particular aspect of the divine. 
Influence on Christian thought. The celestial hierarchy has a lasting impact on Christian spirituality, liturgy, and the arts. The distinction between the various orders of angels inspired medieval theologians, mystics, and artists to elaborate upon the roles and symbols associated with each core or category. This work also contributed to the development of the structured cosmos where everything has its place and purpose, mirroring the structured society of medieval Europe. Article 5, the key of Solomon, the key of Solomon from the text known as the Clavicula Solomonesis. <laughs> right, these, these are rare texts, by the way, guys. These are rare texts. The key of Solomon, the Clavicula Salamos is also known as, is a famous grimoire or book of magic traditionally attributed to King Solomon. Through his actual, though its actual origin are much later, dating back to the Middle Ages. This text is considered one of the most influential works in Western occultism, occultism, right? Uh, providing detailed instructions for the invocations evocations and control of spirits including angels and demons well that explains why solomon used to use his ring of power to control the demonic forces do you guys know that that he that solomon had the ability to control demonic entities um we all have that power of course let me continue let me continue where am i where am i the Grimoire is divided into two books, each detailing various magical rituals, pentacles, and talismans used to come in to, I'm sorry, used to summon and command the spiritual forces. All right, overview of contents. Okay. Preparation for the magician. The text emphasizes the purity and preparation of the practitioner, including instructions on fasting, prayers, and the creation of special garments and tools necessary for prefer performing these rituals. The preparation is crucial for the protection of the magician and for ensuring the effectiveness of the conjurations. This is coming from Solomon, by the way, guys. Remember, Solomon was a magician. He was a wizard, right? He was a wizard. The construction of magical tools. Detailed instructions are provided for making the instruments of magic, such as the magical ring, right, which is the ring of power, the ring of power that Solomon used to wear, uh, that allowed him to enslave the demons of Goyish, for those that have read his work, his esoteric work, of course. Uh, let's see, the practical, okay, the Solomon, where am I, where am I? Um... <laughs> Uh, let's see, the key, okay, construction, tools, detail, uh, making them such as the magical ring, sword, pentacles, and the circle of protection within which the magician must stand to safely summon the spirits. The pentacles, the key of Solomon is particularly renowned for its detailed design of pentacles, magical talisman engraved with symbols, names of God, and the names of angels and planetary spirits. These Pentacles serve various purposes, such as invoking angelic powers, achieving love, or acquiring wealth and knowledge, invocations of spirits. The Grimoire contains elaborate rituals for invoking both angels and demons, detailing the specific days, hours, and astrological conditions under which these spirits should be summoned. The invocations include long prayers and conjurations, calling upon the spirits by name and commanding them by the power of God and the angels to appear and obey the magician. Okay. The magical operations. These are specific rituals aimed at achieving particular outcomes, such as finding hidden treasures, understanding the language of animals, or gaining the love of another person. Each operation includes instructions on the timing materials, and specific spirits to be invoked. The role of angels. Throughout the text, angels are invoked for their protection and assistance in controlling the demons summoned by the magician. The key of Solomon often calls upon the four archangels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel, placing them in positions of authority over the spirits of the lower hierarchies. Theological and magical implications. 
The key of Solomon reflects a complex synthesis of Jewish, Christian, and Arabic or Aramic magical traditions, blending elements of Kabbalah, Christian archaeology, and the astrological magic of the medieval Islamic world. The text presents a universe teeming with spirit entities, each with its own nature and powers, which can be harnessed by the knowledgeable magician. Despite its focus on practical magic, the Grimoire, the Grimoire insists on the magician's purity, righteousness, and the invocation of divine names as essential for the success and the safety of the magical operator. Influence and Legacy the key of Solomon has had a profound impact on Western esoteric traditions, influencing Renaissance magic, the development of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and modern ceremonial magic. Its system of pentacles, invocations, and magical operations has been adapted and incorporated into numerous magical practices and traditions. The Grimoire, Grimoire's emphasis on detailed ritual preparation, the use of specific magical tools and the invocation of higher spiritual powers for the control of the lower entities has set a standard for Western magical practices that continues to be influential till today. All right, I'm almost done. <laughs> In essence, the key of Solomon is a cornerstone of Western magical literature, offering a detailed and systematic approach to the summoning and commanding of spiritual forces through the meticulously applications of ritual magic, its blending of spiritual hierarchy, magical symbols, and the interplay between angelic and demonic forces reflects a medieval world view where the spiritual and material realms are intricately connected and can be influenced through the art and science of magic. Article 6, the Coptic Gnostic Library. The Coptic Gnostic Library is a collection of old stories and teachings Found in Egypt, these writings help us understand Gnosticism, a belief from a long time ago that thought special knowledge could help people. Gnostics believe in many gods and angels, each with their own roles and stories, different from what many people learn in church. The angel hierarchy. In these texts, angels are like, are like workers with different jobs in a big company. Some are high up, close to the boss who is the main God with the capital G <laughs> and others have jobs that connect them more to us, the people living on earth. Think of it like having, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. Think of it like having managers, superiors and workers each with their own duties to keep things running smoothly. Angelic jobs, angel jobs, rather. The angel's main job was to help manage the world and guide people. Some angels were messengers bringing news or advice. Others helped protect people or taught them important lessons. Each angel had a special area that looked after like health, wisdom, or nature. Why they matter. For Gnostics, knowing that these angels and what they did was very important. They believed that understanding the angelic jobs and how the spiritual world worked could help people feel closer to God and live better lives. It was like having a map that showed how everything in the universe was connected and how to navigate through life with the help of these spiritual guides. Imagine having a big invincible team of helpers, each ready to support you in different ways. Some could offer comfort when you're sad, while others could give you that push you need to learn something new or make a huge decision. Stories in the Library Stories in the library. The stories and teachings of the Coptic Gnostic Library are like a treasure chest full of ancient secrets and wisdom. They tell us about these angels, the names, and their jobs in a way that was meant to help people feel not so alone in the big wide universe. Reading these texts is like peeking into a very old book of secrets about the cosmos and how people thought everything in it worked together. In simple words, the Coptic Gnostic Library gives us a glimpse into a world where angels are busy at work all around us, each with a specific or special role, helping keep the balance and guiding people towards understanding and peace.
Awesome. Okay, so I just wanted to share all of that information with you guys. As we uncover the celestial coats together, I want to welcome everyone who is in the house, all 822 people. Welcome, welcome. I wanted to express deep gratitude for spending time and being here on this Wednesday evening on the 7th of February, 2013, no, <laughs> 2024. <laughs> See, <laughs> my mind is traveling back into the past and into the future, guys. I'm going quantum, all right? I'm going quantum, right? Where time doesn't exist. 2024, <laughs> February the 7th. I keep saying the number 13. For those that didn't know, I love the number 13 for many reasons, all right? Uh, one in particular is because it pertains to the hidden sun, right? The Ophiuchus, the 12 signs or the 12 zodiacs revolving around the 13th, the unseen one symbolizing the Christ, the central sun, Ophiochus, the mother goddess. That's the reason why I love 13. It's bringing us back to alignment with our divine higher self. How is everyone doing in the house? I hope you guys are doing well. I am uh, ready to take some uh, questions at this time. I'm going to go ahead and take those questions from my phone. All right, so the first question that I'm going to take is coming from, uh, let's see. Oh, first I want to acknowledge Ricky Lee, 1111, Sylvia Vidal, Sony McCarthy, Sam Griffin, John Park, Sandra, Beatrice, Beatrice Lee, uh, Sylvie, Rochelsa, uh, Lee Star, Edward, uh, John, John's in the house. Everyday luxury, the light inside, Elizabeth and the Master, joyful, the list goes on. I just want to welcome everybody. So I did shout out to a few of the Galactic Jedi. So now I'm going to be looking for some questions. Let's see, where are all the questions? At? Oh, by the way, guys, please um, make sure you write your questions in capital letters. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Tony, how you doing, brother? Welcome, welcome. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Blue, Blue's in the house. Thank you so much for the super chat. Greetings, Ishmael. The Pluto return for two years is is uh, ending on the 22nd. I think uh, it did what I did very well. Um, and what is the North Star? Well, the North Star is called Polaris. And um, that so happened, coincidentally speaking, Polaris was actually the first civilization that existed on planet Earth. Um, following the Larendera Spora when we first colonized our solar system, right? So, so that was known as the Polarian uh, civilization. Now, the, the fact that the Pluto return for two years is ending on the 22nd could be paramount to what's going to be happening also on this plane of reality. Uh, perhaps is the EBS, perhaps is the Great Solar Flash, who knows? But I've been hearing that, you know, sometime this month, uh, a lot of great things are going to be happening. Huge things are going to be happening. So we'll see what happens, guys. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Not the, the Mothman says, I time traveled from the year 2420 to be here. Well, welcome from the future. And by the way, guys. All the volunteers, the old souls that are down here in the third dimension, we all come from the future. Because as we move up into higher dimensions, we go into futures. We go into the future, right? The higher dimensions are equivalent to the future. The lower dimensions are the past, by the way. Do you have another super chat from Ricky Lee, who's in the house, 1111? Ishmael, any idea how much the solar flares are activating our DNA? See you at the expo. 
Um, big time, brother. Big time. We just had an M class uh, CME, I think, in the last few days that is actually hitting us. So, you know, some of us are experiencing physical symptoms like heart palpitations, back pain, chest pain, heart pain. It's not that your guys are having a heart attack. It's because the hypothalamus, due to the CMEs that are coming in, is activating the high heart, high heart chakra. <laughs> so that's what's happening, brother. And yes, you know, they are activating our dormant DNA. All right. We are all going through a massive mutation as I speak. Again, guys, make sure you write your questions in capital letters. I do have another super chat from Blue Only. You know, if ancient Atlantean and Kemet, which is Egypt, the original um, Egypt, by the way, uh, smoked herb. <laughs> um from what I understand, uh, that was a plant that was brought to us by the gods. Um, it came from the Pleiades. It came from the Pleiades. Um, it's a sacred plant, just like, you know, magic, M-U-S-H-R-O, you know what I mean, right? Just like any medicinal plant, right? It's, it's, it's an entity. And if you use it for spiritual reasons, it's just a, it's, it's just a tool, all right, but the, the whole point now is to let go of all the tools, guys, to do it naturally. All right, so if you guys could do it naturally, that's even better. But, uh, you know, throughout history, there were some ascended beings, not ascended beings, but people on the path of enlightenment, right? Initi people that were going through the initiation process that used that, you know, the plant um, to expand their mind and to further connect with their higher self. But they didn't abuse it. There is a difference, right? The people that depend on it uh, are addicted, right? If if you are in a position to not be dependent on any substance, then you're golden, all right? But if you need to depend on anything, then it's best to start, you know, reducing the amount so that way you can do it naturally. That's my advice to all of you. I see another super chat from Sean Sean Coffee, is it coffee? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, joyful. How you doing, joyful? Thank you for your super chat. Ishmael, can you please be honest? I want to know the reason this movie is taking so long to come to the end. Please don't say it's the timeline. The evil, the alliance, I've heard it all too many times. Joyful, everything in divine timing. Just know that we first begin to cleanse the dark or to bring the balance in the higher dimension. So it's just a matter of time before it trickles down into this third dimension. But in the higher dimensions, the light is already prevailing. So we have already won the war. Yes, we have, right? We just have to be patient. We just have to be patient to answer your question. Um, trust me, I wish I could snap my fingers and we could all be in the new earth ascended right? Living in harmony and balance with all of life. I wish I could just do that. But I'm just a fractal, all right? I'm just a fractal, just like each and every single one of you. But the more we focus our collective thought into the things that we want to manifest individually and collectively, the faster we're going to get there, the faster we're going to get there. To answer your question, Joy, joyful. Thank you for being here, sister. Trenton Williams, thank you so much for your donation, brother. How well versed are you in regards to what dimensions the different races are from? What dimensions are speakings, blue avians, uh, and Nihal from? Well, I've heard of the speakings. I'm not really sure where they're from. Um, but I know that the blue avians are from the... 12 dimension. They come from the realms of eternity. 
And I know that the Nihal, the Nihal are from the ninth dimension. So those are collectives, right? Once we go into the sixth dimension, we do become part of the social memory complex. So these are social memory complex. But as far as the speak-ins, I've heard of them. I just don't know in details as to where they come from, to answer your question. But, hey, Trenton, if you know where they come from or if you know anything about the speak-ins or spike-ins, please drop it in the comment section. I would love to know. Um, I do have another chat from Mary Jane, Mary Jane G. Thank you so much for being in the house, sister. Can you do a meditation to send love and light to the people in fear? Love you, Ishmael. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we could do that at the end of the live. Why not? All right, let's see. Valentina Peneva, thank you so much for the super chat. Hi, Ishmael. Where is the astral realm? Is it a vibrational state? Do entities from the lower astral realm affect the entities from the higher realm? The astral realm is the fourth dimension. They're one and the same. And it is coexisting with our reality, but on a different plane. Yes, on a different vibrational frequency. Um, that's where we go when we go to sleep, by the way. We go to the astral realm, right? Most of us are spiritual warriors in the astral realm, slaying archon entities and demonic forces. And then uh, the second part of your question is, do entities from the lower astral realm affect the entities from the higher realm? Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, they don't affect it at all. In fact, the entities from the higher realms have absolute control over the entities from the astral fourth dimensional realm. All right, and the next question is from uh, Stuart Williams. Thank you so much for your super chat. Where did Atlantis go? Well, on a parallel Earth, Atlantis never collapsed. It never sunk. It's still there. It exists in the Terra Earth. The Terra Earth exists in the second harmonic frequency. We're part of the first harmonic frequency. The second harmonic frequency is Earth operating in dimensions four, five, and six. So that's where Atlantis is. That's where Tartaria is. That's where all the advanced civilizations are. And when the solar flash takes place, we are going to be translated into the Terra Earth. And then uh, let's see. Any more? Any more? Oh, yeah. There's another super chat from David Isington. Thanks so much, brother. Do you think we are here to endure the lowest density so we can, like a trampoline, <laughs> bounce back stronger than ever, raising all our higher selves, raising all of our root chakras. Absolutely, guys. The lower we go in dimensions, the lower we experience densities, the higher we evolve, right? It is the way the soul and the universe continues expanding by refracting, descending, and ascending. Each descent is the outbreath of God. It is the division, the div the um, the involution of spirit into matter, right? As we ascend, we become one again. We become integrated again. So yeah, the lower we go into, the lower we descend, the higher we ascend. That is absolutely correct. And yes, ultimately, the whole process and the whole purpose of ascension is to integrate the higher chakras with the lower chakras, heaven and earth. So that's what we're here to do, guys. Alrighty, so I'm just looking for random questions at this point. Ricky Lee is saying that I missed a few super chats. How did I do that? Let's see. I'm going to check on my laptop to see what I missed. How's everyone doing, by the way? I hope you guys are doing awesome. All right, so I answered Joyful. I answered Trenton Williams. 
Uh, who else did I answer? Uh, let's see. I've answered David. David as well, Essington. And I've also answered Stuart Williams, who actually just asked where did Atlantis go. So, no, I don't think I missed any Super Chats. Who knows? Maybe the uh, the whatever it is that controls technology is erasing some of the Super Chats. I have no clue. But, uh, yeah, I'm not getting them on my end. I, I mean, I'm getting some. But if you're saying that I'm missing some, is probably because they're somewhat not showing up on my end. I apologize. It's not my fault. We are at war here with artificial intelligence as a reminder. <sighs> Silva Vidal saying, you missed my question, Ishmael. I want to retype it, Sylvia, because I don't, I don't see it. I don't see any questions. I mean, there's almost uh, 900 people on the chat, so... <laughs> If you guys, again, if you guys have a question, type it in capital letters so it could stand out. It's like a highlight, you know? That way I could bypass the chat and get to your questions. Eric uh, Pepe is asking me if I support the ball earth lie. Well, you know... It doesn't matter if you believe in the flat earth or the round earth or whatever, you know, it's let's put our differences aside and let's just all unify as one human family at this time, because we have a common enemy, right? And that is darkness. That is the corruption, the evil. So it doesn't matter what I believe in and it doesn't matter what you believe in. What matters is that we all want to be free and we all want to reclaim our sovereignty and that is the common denominator that should bind us together as one family, guys. Uh, let's see. I do have another super chat from Sean Coley's. How you doing, brother? Uh, third time a charm. Best reptilian protection hacks. <laughs> All right, guys. The best way to protect yourself from any evil or shadow entities is by... Finding the zero-point field within yourself. See, duality, good and evil, only exist as a result of buying into the game. If you want to exit the matrix, the duality world that we live in, all you got to do is collapse that polarity within yourself, reach zero point, and that's how you best protect yourself. At that point, evil can no longer affect you because it no longer exists in your reality. Think about it. Reach zero point within. Stop trying to fight it without. Reach zero point within. Find that equilibrium where the duality becomes a singularity. And when you do that, there is no more evil. There is no more evil. And that's how we win this war, by the way, guys. By finding the zero point field within ourselves. That was a very good question, Sean. Let's all be nice here, guys. Even if we have flat earthers or round earthers, um, it, religious people or non-religious people, let's all give each other the respect and realize that we are all fragments of the one creator. All right? Try to see the God in everyone, even if they disagree with your belief systems. Let's just try to see the Christ in everyone. That is my suggestion. So we welcome everyone here. I want to welcome everyone. Because each and every single one of you guys has a soul, right? Unlike the NPCs. If you're a bot, if you're an NPC, then forget it. But if you have a soul, I recognize the God within you. I acknowledge and honor the Christ within you. If you have a soul, of course. <clears throat> All right, so this is a super chat from Blue. Blue only. I'm doing... Awesome as well. It was one of my super chats that you did not see. Aha. But I asked, I asked, do you know what the color orange represents? Well, it's a healing color. Um, it's also uh, the second chakra, the sacral chakra. 
And um, it also corresponds to the second dimension of the telluric mineral kingdom, right? Each chakra represents a phase in the evolution of consciousness, right? The first chakra is the chakra that represents the first dimension, right? And then the second chakra represents the, the second dimension, which is the plant kingdom, um, the, the, you know, the, um, the crystals, the stones, and so on and so forth. The third chakra represents the third dimension, which corresponds to the mammalian kingdom, the animals, the humans, and so on and so forth. Uh, the fourth, as a collective, we are all ascending to the fourth chakra, which is the heart chakra, right? We're all moving up into the beginning stages of the angelic realms, right? As we become physical angels. So, yes, that's what orange represents. It represents the second chakra, and it's also the color of healing, all right? So when somebody is wounded, you could always put your hands on them and just infuse them with orange energy, and it'll heal their wounds. But you have to believe, of course, you have to believe. All right, this is a good one from Julia J. She says, any information on monads? Well, that is our original form as wholesome beings of light. We all started off in the 12 dimension. That's us existing in the 12 dimensions. As we continue up the ladder of ascension, eventually we're all going to integrate all the different avatars, all the different versions of ourselves, and become our monad, which is the equivalent of all your ancestors and all your descendants as one big gigantic soul and then of course above the monad then we have the over soul which is god prime creator Michelle Herrick is asking me, what do you know about Lilith? Was she Adam's first wife? Um, all right. According to mythology, wasn't Lilith associated with the serpent seed? Perhaps she was the wife or the, the yeah, the wife or, or the counterpart of Lucifer. Perhaps we don't know. You know, I really don't know much, but I've, I've, uh, I did hear that. Lilith was um, the opposite of Eve. Eve was supposed to be, you know, the, the righteous daughter of God. And Lilith was the unrighteous daughter, or may I say, the, the child of or the wife of Lucifer. I don't know. I don't know much about Lilith. But if you do, please, please drop it in the chat box. Uh. All right, so Janine is asking, how will it be when we reunite with our loved ones who have passed away, like my parents, uh, and to visit our loved ones who did not get into the fifth dimension? Well, um, whether they ascended or transitioned to the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension, regardless of where you go, whether you go to the fourth dimensional earth or the fifth dimensional earth, um, they're going to be there waiting for you. And if you go to the fifth dimensional earth and they're in the fourth dimensional earth, then you're going to have the ability to descend and uh, enter into their realm and their reality. So despite of where they're at, you will see them again because technically they're not dead, right? They just shed their third dimensional avatar and they merge with a higher dimensional avatar. No, there is no such thing as death, guys. No one dies. It is all an experience. Every realm, every density, every dimension, it is all an experience. Death is an illusion, by the way. Uh, Sylvia Vidal is asking, Ishmael, will the solar flash wipe away the monkey rhesus thingy in the DNA? Absolutely. The solar flash is 
totally going to dismantle and undo the lower complex, the R complex, which is the reptilian brain, the monkey gene, for those that are RH positive, and uh, activate to the higher mind, which is this mind that comes into activity or function as a result of the integration between the left and the right hemisphere. So yes, to answer your question, Silva Vidal, absolutely. The monkey gene, the primitive gene, that Enki, the master geneticist has installed in us to downgrade us, is going to be undone. Thank you for all the love, guys. I appreciate the uh, all the likes. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right, this is a good one from, uh, hmm, see if I could read your name, from Mult, Multam in Parvo. Multam in Parvo is asking, Ishmael, how do we deal with fear at this time? Well, the opposite of fear is love. Why fear? There is no need to fear anymore, guys. Well, first you have to understand that fear is a tactic, okay? It is a tactic imposed by the dark side to keep us in a state of giving away our power, right? Of losing. So stop. There is no need to fear anymore. Step into your power. Know who you are. Know thyself. He used to say, Socrates, know thyself and know that you are a being that was made in the image of the one, right? Which means you have access to everything in your heart. All the answers are there. So we replace fear through love and compassion. That's how we overcome fear. There is no need to fear, but fear itself, right? There is a saying that says fear is the false evidence appearing real, right? It's all part of the matrix. It's all part of the old paradigm that is now collapsing. So there is no need to fear anymore. Edward, thank you so much for the super chat. And your question is, we all love you, Brother Ishmael. Thank you for all you do for humanity. When will our, when will your courses start? Pretty soon. I'm working on my website, guys. I'm going to, I'm going solo. I'm going to offer different types of classes. Um, pretty soon. I'll let you guys know when my courses are up and running. And um, yeah, you know, it's, I'm going to open up the, uh, the Cosmic Academy of Light, you could call it. The Cosmic Academy of Light. It's going to be mind-blowing, by the way. I will be incorporating some of the knowledge that is going to be in my next book. And my next book is probably going to be published in about a year or two. Again, guys, it took me 10 years just to write our Cosmic Origin. But if you haven't read our Cosmic Origin, the link is always in the description. Make sure you order your copy. Um in order to understand what I'm even talking about half the time. <laughs> you know, a lot of the questions you guys ask me are actually answered in my book, Our Cosmic Origin. That's right. Marina, our sister Marina is saying zero point which is singularity, <laughs> blocks out the chaos. It's where our soul is at peace. Absolutely. And that is the true meaning of Christ consciousness, guys. It is a state of singularity where good and evil does, is not at play anymore. Duality doesn't exist. It's all part of a game, by the way. A game. Remember that. Duality, good and evil, is all a game from a higher level of reality 
looking down is just a game. That's all it is. The only way to exit that game is by collapsing the polarity duality into zero point within you. And then at that point, you are indivisible, untouchable. <laughs> That's right. Albert Sanchez Jr. is saying, seeing creator God in everyone allows us to forgive others. Absolutely, guys. And that also includes the unawakened, right? The unawakened, those that are still part of the matrix. We, we still have to give them the benefit of the doubt and just see the Christ within themselves. And who knows? That might even help them awaken faster, right? Because your consciousness, your perception has an influence on the collective reality and others, by the way. Again, guys, please show respect for everyone in here. Um, flat earth, round earth, religious, spiritual, atheist, agnostic. I don't care. We're all welcome. Every single one. Let's let's all be the let's all become the Christ by seeing the Christ in everyone even if they have different belief systems. So let's just show respect for everyone. Remember, guys, we need to unify. You know, all these little differences in opinions and beliefs is what distract, it's what divides us. How do you think the cabal has been in power for so long? Because of the division. The moment humanity unifies and learns to agree to disagree on the little stuff, guess what? We gain our power back. Remember that. I'm looking at some of the chat here, and it's like <laughs> there's no need to conflict. There's no need to argue, guys, or to say anything negative about anyone. We're all children of the one God. All right, and then pretty soon, Ra, I'm going to start the uh, meditation for the closing. So I'm just looking for a couple more questions. Is the light still flickering above me? <laughs> Somebody asked. Sunshine is saying, you have your glasses on. We can't blame the glasses. All right. Thank you for the super chat, Sunshine. I appreciate that. This is a good one. Who do we ask for assist, assistance with ascension and protection? Well, we could ask our ancestors, our spirit team, the angels, the archangels, and all of those celestial functionaries that are meant to serve us. That's who we could ask. Yes, this is correct. Albert Sanchez Jr. is saying, is the earth slightly rotating counterclockwise and will it adjust back to the clockwise rotation? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Yes. The reason it has that uh, wobble um, was because it was thrown off its original orbit by the Anunnaki, negative Anunnaki, that took over the affairs of the world, right? When they set up the moon and the sun and uh, the, the Saturn matrix through the black 
through the black satellite antenna. So that's why our, our Earth has been in that wobble for, I think, about 15,000 years now, or even 10,000 to be exact. <laughs> mm. I'm just looking for one more question and we'll do our collective meditation. I'm looking for one good question, guys, before we do the uh, meditation tonight. Oh, this is a good one from Kamala. Kamala Ng Mans Manson. In Ng Manson. Kamala is asking, uh, when are we considered awakened? Is it when the Kundalini has risen or something else? Uh Yes, the activation of our seven chakras, which are metaphorically described in the book of Revelation as the seven lamps, the seven seals, is the kundalini rising, which in turn triggers the activation of the markaba, the ka body, the light body, you know, whatever you want to call it. When we activate the light body, we begin to use the crystalline genetic structure. All right, so that's when we are going to be fully activated and awakened. America Sosa is asking me, Ishmael, suggestion on forgiveness. Yeah, it all starts with yourself. Always first forgive yourself, guys. You know, whether you know it or not, unconsciously, we've done ourselves wrong in a lot of ways by the choices we made in the past. So first learn to love yourself by forgiving yourself and, and being good to yourself. And then you forgive others. So forgiveness is key in the liberation of of our soul and the regaining of our spiritual sovereignty. Absolutely. One final question from Silva Vidal. She's asking, Ishmael, can you see the orbs around you without the screen? Uh, no, I don't see the orbs around me, but I'm sure you guys could. But, you know, when I watch this on the replay, and I do sometimes, I watch my own lives, <laughs> um, I do see the orbs around me. So thank you for pointing it out, Sylvia. I appreciate that. And uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get comfy so that we do uh, our group meditation. <laughs> All right. So ah, let's sit in a comfortable position, guys. Let's sit in a comfortable position. Relax. Take a few deep breaths, inhaling with our nose and exhaling with our mouth. And let's do it a few more times.
All right, now that we are all relaxed, let's bring our awareness and consciousness to the center of our being, which is our heart. So bring your awareness to your heart, the heart of your soul, the center of your soul. Now that we all have our attention in our heart, let's collectively send love and radiation from our heart to all of our cells in our body. Let's flood our own bodies with this divine love from our hearts. And use your mind to visualize liquid light pouring, radiating from your heart into every fiber of your being, every cell, every particle. So now you're seeing yourself infused with light all over, generated from your heart. You're flooded with light. Every fiber of your being is full of light. And now let's visualize and see that radiation of light and send it to everyone on the chat and everyone on the replay who's going to watch it. Let's send it to one another because we're all brothers and sisters. So let's radiate that love to each and every single being or person in this chat and those that watch it on the replay. And now let's together send that collective liquid light of love, compassion, and understanding to everybody in your life, everybody that is involved in your life, whether they're friends, comrades, associates, business partners, just send love to everybody that you know. Family members, whether they are awakened or not, just send them love. And now let's take that collective love and shower the entire planet and by flooding it with the liquid love coming from all of our collective hearts. So let's all visualize Earth being engulfed in that liquid love, liquid light of love. Transmuting all darkness, collapsing the duality back into oneness, balance, purity, Christ consciousness. And now let's expand that love to the entire universe, transmuting any imbalances, any distortions, to bringing it back to zero point everywhere. Which is balance, harmony. <sighs> And now that we've collapsed the polarity duality in the entire universe, let's send it to the entire multiverse, the omniverse, and bringing that back into balance.
Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And we will see you on the next one. May the God Force be with each and every single one of you, always. And feel free and continue the meditation on your own if you want. Thank you.